A warm welcome to episode 40 of Lost for Words. I am your host Jason and this week's episode focuses on the energy sources of the past, present and future. Ewan Gibbs is a historian, lecturer at the University of Glasgow and is the author of Coal Country, The Meaning and Memory of Deindustrialisation in Post-War Scotland. Ewan joins me to discuss Scotland's history with coal, global deindustrialisation and the present journey towards global decarbonisation which has recently presented itself in this country through the prism of COP26. Ewan and I also chat about how climate change is invariably impacted by political decisions, when in fact it should be political decisions that are impacted by climate change. Ewan's level of knowledge on his subject is impeccable, and he speaks passionately about all things coal and where we are headed in the future with regards to renewable energy. A quick housekeeping note before we get started. Please leave a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts, whether that be Apple, Google, Spotify, Podbean or any other platform. It's the best way the podcast can grow and better content can be produced for you, the listener. It's your listening experience that matters the most. But enough from me, now on to today's episode of Lost for Words. So from the beginning, just tell me a bit about where you grew up and about your academic studies. I grew up in Edinburgh, which is why I support Hibernian Football Club. Um, I grew up (laughs) just off Easter Road slash Leaf Walk. Um, I was, I suppose, before I came to university, actually, when I was at school, I was involved in bits of socialist politics, um, stuff around the anti-war movement, which for younger listeners was the anti-Iraq war movement, which started in 2003, but was quite a big form of left-wing politics in Scotland to, for a few years afterwards. Um, I came to university in 2008. Uh, actually, on my freshers week, RBS collapsed, and we, some of us excitedly thought capitalism was falling to pieces, but it certainly was a a major moment, you know, in, in the the remaking of politics and society. And I think the reverberations of that are still being felt. Um, When I was at university, I became increasingly interested in economic and social history, um, which was the degree I studied as an undergraduate. And I did an honours dissertation about the poll tax non-payment campaign in Glasgow because I was very interested in labour movement politics, socialist politics and working class history. And um, through that, I I also developed an interest in oral history. So I combined research from the archives of this large social movement, which um, if if viewers aren't familiar with it, was a a movement that was provoked by major changes to local government taxation, which meant everybody played a a flat rate so essentially, it was a massive negative redistribution of wealth. Um, and it was also implemented a year earlier in Scotland uh, because the Scottish Conservative Party asked for it to be, but it wasn't very popular in a context where the Conservative Party's representation has fallen dramatically and there was increasing clamour for devolution already at that point. So I interviewed activists that had been involved in that campaign. Um, and that made me realise that deindustrialisation was also very important in thinking about recent Scottish history. The non-payment campaign was strongest in peripheral housing schemes uh, in Glasgow, where there were large numbers of people who were unemployed, especially young men who, whose fathers and grandfathers had likely worked in shipyards or railway locomotive works or other heavy industrial workplaces. Um, and I think also as I start to think about long-term impacts and, and developments in Scottish history, it became apparent that the end of the industrial economy across a much longer time period than just the 1980s was a, a hugely important factor in, in shaping our current political situation. And that led me to doing a PhD on uh, deindustrialization in the Scottish coal fields. Um, where I picked up where I left off in terms of developing a much larger oral history project. Um, 
also doing more work in the archives of the labour and trade union movement, as well as the archives of industry and government. And I finished that in 2016, but I did a lot more work around that area, particularly on energy policy. And I recently wrote a book called Coal Country, the meaning and memory of the industrialisation in post-war Scotland, which you can read online for free if that sounds like something you'd be interested in. Um, I guess over time as well, it's that idea of the meaning and memory that's appealing to me increasingly, that we need, obviously, a version of history which accurately reflects events, but as an oral historian, I'm also increasingly interested not just in what happened to people in the past, but also how they've rationalised and understood that as individuals and also collectively um, at different levels of society. The other thing I'll say before I stop boring your listeners is um, I suppose more recently I've become very interested in energy as a much larger subject. Um, over the course of my PhD and, and then subsequent studies at the National Archives in London, it became very obvious to me that the end of the coal economy was about changes in energy and oil and nuclear replacing coal to some extent especially competition in power generation and power station planning and i've come to understand that they are highly politicized decisions are not simply technological changes or you know a story of straightforward economic progress by any sense and obviously in our current context or our current climate, should I say, our changing climate, these are um, increasingly important questions and they're especially important in Scottish politics just now in the, the debate over the future of the Campbell oil field and whether we can provide what's increasingly being referred to as a just transition for workers in the oil sector. What is, so for almost for a dummy, what is deindustrialisation and why does it matter? To know about it in 2021? It's a good question. Um, in a technical economic sense, deindustrialization just means the declining significance of industrial activities to employment and to economic production. So if we want to put it very simply, it means that proportionately less and less people in an economy are employed in industrial activities which we could loosely think of as mining, manufacturing and some forms of transport like dock work and, and railway work. Um, I think it's politically important then that we, all, we start to think about who worked in those sectors. Um, we're talking about mass employing sectors that tended to employ people that didn't have higher education level qualifications that are also politically associated with um, collectivism, with trade unionism and with forms of socialist or social democratic politics. And so why is deindustrialization important, you ask them? So I've told you what it is. Um, partly because I'm enough of an old fashioned Marxist to think that what people do for a living, how they, how they earn their means of subsistence, is very important to how they relate to other people and think about the world. So a society where a large portion of people are miners and factory workers will look very different to a society where most people are small farmers or one where most people work in offices. And I think that's the basic level that, that, that I think this is important. Um, and that's true around the world, obviously. Um, Scotland is not the only country to have experienced the industrialization Britain, most economies in Western Europe, uh, Eastern Europe as well, actually, and North America have also experienced these changes. So I think it's important to thinking about some of the big shifts that have happened. I think that the rising importance of Scottish nationhood and constitutional politics over a long time period, and then more recently, more specifically, I guess, the demise of the Labour Party in Scotland, or it's certainly it's decreasing significance, you know, deindustrialisation is part of that story. Um, I think around the world, the crisis of the centre-left in many ways, you know, Democrats in the United States, or the social, you know, the Communist Party disappeared in Italy, and then the, the broad centre-left fell away there. Like, we have 
different versions of, of similar themes. Um, and I think to understand those sorts of changes, which are often told quite episodically, you know, it's because this politician made this decision or something like that. It's actually more useful to have an understanding of structural changes in, in capitalist societies. And I think deindustrialization is quite a powerful one. I think as well, thinking maybe less about the political and more about how people live their lives, deindustrialization is massive as well. Um, it's indirectly and directly contributed to rising rates of economic inequality, to health inequalities, to educational inequalities. It's contributed to a more unequal society and in a society where people's life chances are actually more determined by birth than they were before, which is not the story we're often told, but that is the, the story that social economic data would tell us. In a political sense, do you think the collapse of the industrial sector, do you think the entire political spectrum has moved towards the right, that even the left in 2021 is more to the right than what it was in 1921? Yes and no, because the complicated thing there is obviously, you know, a socialist platform in Britain did win 40% of the vote in, in 2017, and that was a, you know, a significant and important moment. But yeah, I think it's, it's definitely true that we live in, you know, even if we think about what Jeremy Corbyn was proposing, it wasn't that radical by the standards of, say, a Labour manifesto from 1974. And at that point, the party was actually, you know, wasn't led by somebody who was regarded as being on the left of the party. Harold Wilson was very much seen as being on the centre or right of the party. Um, I think that's an outcome of of results of class struggle, to be crude about it, that it's very hard to put forward the sort of manifesto Labour put forward in 1974, even from a radical left position because of the situation we are now in, in terms of how far back the Labour movement has been thrown in particular, but also, you know, tenants organisations were a lot stronger then as well. Um, forms of community organisation were a lot stronger then as well. Like a lot of this isn't actually about what people at the top of political parties say and do. It's also about power at the base of society. And I suppose that's part of what I'm interested in through deindustrialization is thinking about those structural changes that have in different ways empowered and disempowered uh, sections of society. What is the le the overall legacy of deindustrialization? Has there been any positive legacy, or has the world just regressed? In your opinion, I mean, I think there are definitely positive dimensions. It's worth saying that on a global scale, there may have been deindustrialization, but it's also grossly uneven. And if we were sitting in Shenzhen right now, surrounded by factories producing all sorts of goods that are then dispatched to those ships that blocked the Suez Canal a few months ago where we, we were, you know, it was revealed to us quite how dependent on global supply chains we are. We might feel a bit differently. But um, obviously in Britain, in Scotland, um, thinking solely about the national structure and economy we have, firstly, the industrialization has let us decarbonize in some ways. Um, and it must be positive that the Clyde now has salmon swimming in it for the first time in a couple of hundred years because we don't have chemical plants and other uh, toxic workplaces, you know, spewing um, pollution into it. Um, I think there's other positives. Deindustrialization is associated broadly with the expansion of public service employment, for instance. That's not all negative by any sense. Um, the creation of a more gender balanced labour market is a positive as well. Um, also, perhaps not having to do highly dangerous jobs is a positive as well, right? Um, I don't think many people wish for their sons or daughters to work in very dangerous uh, coal mines or factories jute mills for instance um, and some deindustrialization actually is caused by 
structural phenomena associated with the development of mature economies. So, you know, there's an extent to which manufacturing is more productive than it used to be. Manufacturing is an engine of productivity. And what that means is that you can produce more and more goods with less and less workers. And that in and of itself isn't a negative. It might have negative consequences depending on how that is organized, but that could be a good thing. Um, but it's also true that another element there is the demand of society tends to shift. So, you know, initially, um, if, if you go from the very poorest sort of societies, people spend most of their income on food. As they get richer, they'll spend more of their income on manufactured goods. As they get richer, they'll start to demand services. They'll start to demand health and education and, and, and other services. That's actually quite sustainable in some ways. That's more human intensive than and less carbon intensive. So there are there are potentially positives. I think the key for me when I think about deindustrialization is often not how it should it have been stopped, but how could it have been better managed? And, and I argue in my book that actually deindustrialization was comparatively well managed in Britain between the 1940s and the 1970s. It was disastrously managed in the 1980s and 1990s, um, and has arguably continued to be managed quite poorly. But other economies as well have arguably had less disastrous experiences than Britain did in the last two decades of the 20th century. So then tell me, I did want to ask about that, what could have been done differently? But then to put a positive spin on it, what is a country or a region that has dealt with deindustrialization better than the UK in the last 20 to 40 years? And why? What made them successful in a way that Britain wasn't? Well, I think we look at what was done. So between the 1940s and 1970s, I argue the industrialization was managed relatively carefully and comparatively well in, in the UK. Um, I studied the coal mining industry. It was Scotland's largest industrial sector at the beginning of the period. I, I started looking at it immediately after the Second World War. And it was also highly important to several large industrial regions of Scotland, like Lanarkshire and Fife. So, if we start with an answer that's grounded in those experiences, I think that might help. Um, part of what I argue in my book is that a more, what I term a moral economy operated in the mining industry around closures. And what I mean by that is that a set of customs were followed by management, workers and trade unions around closures. So closures were broadly negotiated with trade unions, which means they were agreed collectively with the workforce. Workers were found alternative employment, usually within travelling distance of their homes. Workers who had relatively high wage positions, say, at, at the coal face or in tunnelling jobs, were found light jobs. Disabled workers were found alternative jobs or pensioned off and given suitable payments, redundancy payments. And um, also, as well as that alternative employment, was provided for areas. So you have the direction of inward investment, new mass production factories, for instance, actually diversify and enhance the economies of the coal fields in this period and provide employment for women at a time when women's employment is expanding remarkably in Britain. So that's a way that you can make these things work. If you want, that is, in my view, a model of a, a form of a just transition that uh, you don't abandon places, you provide forms of economic security, and you consult the people that are being affected by these changes, especially the workforces, but also the communities as a whole. Um, have other places done this? Well, you know, I'm not saying everywhere else that's experienced the industrialization is. is in some sort of utopian state, and I'm not saying the examples I'm going to give demonstrate that, but it's worth noting that the last deep coal mine shut in Germany in 2018, and actually something else I think is really important to say is that until recently, very recently, Britain was still burning substantial volumes of coal, but it was, it was importing it. So 
it's not, you know, there's, a, there's been a certain amount of green, what I'd call greenwashing of the closure of the coal mining industry. Like closing down coal mines to import coal is not environmentally sound or sustainable. And Britain could have achieved the same closures over a longer, t- staggered time period. Um, probably at, at less financial cost when you consider the cost of benefit payments, regional policy, subsidies that were provided to low-wage employers in the coal fields. So Germany followed a path more like that, and it only closed its last uh, deep mine quite recently. And it hasn't had, certainly in former West Germany, former East Germany is a totally different story, obviously, it, didn't have the same extent of devastation that you saw in, say, Fife or Yorkshire in, in Britain. Um, because it followed a, a system of co-determination, so unions, workers in the state were basically doing what happened in Britain between the 40s and 70s, but they kept doing it. Um, and that's been much more successful, certainly for the workforce. The other thing that I think they did in the Ruhr Valley in Germany, which you know, again, there have been problems of unemployment there. This isn't a perfect picture, but um, they didn't write off their heavy industries. And firms like Feiss and Krupp are now active in sectors like renewables. So firms that have origins in heavy industry and in coal and steel have advanced uh, with state support into other new sectors. And... I think if more attention had been made to prioritising domestically owned firms in the UK rather than regional policies that were based on attracting inward investment from elsewhere, we might have been in a better position to do something like that as well. Then if we move on to the writing of the book, when did it become a thought in your head to put all your thoughts together in that form? Well, I finished my PhD in 2016 and put it in a drawer uh, metaphorically and you know I, <laughs> I wrote up some shorter papers that were based on that and then I put in an application to go and do some extra work uh, Katrina, Dr Katrina MacDonald who is a colleague of mine now but is a senior lecturer in Scottish history was my internal examiner and she said What's all this? You know, there's all this stuff about electricity sort of floating around this. Why don't you say more about that? And and, and that was a really helpful bit of advice. So I went down to the National Archives and looked through these records from the UK government. And, you know, some of the material was really interesting. Material from the 1950s that demonstrated um, civil servants in the Ministry of Fuel and Tower talking about the need to transition Britain from coal to oil to break the miners' stranglehold. That's a direct quote on Britain's economy to move away from a society where railway men and, and miners who were both heavily unionised had a lot of say over, you know, turning the lights on and moving stuff around the country it was a big priority for them. So... I read through a lot of this sort of material, included a lot of material about competition between fuel sources or competition between advocates of different fuel sources, I should say. Um, And I thought, okay, this is new stuff. I can use this alongside all the work I've done in my book. I can start to think in a bit more depth about these testimonies that I've collected. Um, Writing a book is different than writing a PhD. In a PhD, you spend a lot of time apologising for yourself is the wrong word, but you have to show your uh, contribution to the scholarship very clearly, be in constant dialogue with the existing academic literature. And that's an important thing to be able to do. But I think writing a book gives you a lot more freedom to tell your own story in a a somewhat uh, grander and more narrative form. And so I was attracted to doing that. And in 20. 17, 18, I developed a book proposal and that was accepted. Um, so from then, I guess, from 2018, I knew I was writing a book. How long did it take all in to write it? Well, I mean, I must have submitted my first draft in sweet, early 2019, but bear in mind, this was also based on work I've been doing for a very long time. 
in a very productive meeting with two book reviewers, uh, two experts from my field, uh, Professor Bill Knox and Professor Keith Gildar gave me some stellar advice and made me more confident, actually, in breaking from that PhD format and writing a book which was heavily based on the oral testimonies in particular. And I think that is what's attracted readers most, and that's understandable. Um, certainly readers outside of you know universities are perhaps most interested in hearing the reflections of minors and former minors former minors and, and, and their, their children and their wives and telling the story of what happened to them and their experience of deindustrialization. Um, so I guess in a way it took me a couple of years, but in another way it probably took me a decade because, you know, I was thinking about these themes from all the way back to when I was doing that research on the full tax. So having all that background and research done and writing a PhD was what made it possible. And I would say that qualitative historical research of the sort that, that I do and that my colleagues do is really labour intensive. Um, actually going, sitting in archives and taking detailed notes, that's time intensive. It takes a lot, a long time to do that. Recording oral histories is also very time intensive. You need to form relationships with people. You need to build trust with them. You then need to interview them. You then need to transcribe interviews. It can take you can take a day to transcribe an interview if it's about an hour and a half very easily. Um, that's a, a labour intensive activity too. But I think you do produce a sort of work which you you know you couldn't read you, you couldn't get the same sort of perspective or insight using other methods. Was there any impact of the pandemic on the timing of the release of your book? Not really. Um, I was worried. I was actually really worried about the pandemic. I thought, well, the, you know, it, it was in March that it came out. And I, I was a bit down in the dumps about it because I've been working on this book for years and I was really liked to have had an in-person launch event with my colleagues at Lollybank House at the University of Glasgow where I'd, I'd worked as a PhD student on, you know, all drafts and stuff in effect for this book. Um, but actually... Well, the virtual launch event, around 150 folk turned up. Um, Brendan Muhan, who was one of the, the former miners I interviewed who worked in the middle of Ian Coalfield, spoke alongside uh, Ariane Mack, who's a colleague, uh, an academic scholar of, of British miners who's based in Paris. I couldn't have done any of those things in real life at Lloyd Bank House, probably. So in a way, you know, I, I don't regret it, actually. Um, and I think the book being available to read online and being available to read for free has been quite positive in that sense as well. Did you or could you write another one or was that a case of you had collected years and years of knowledge, interviews, archives and you put it all together and this is your, not your life's work, but the pinnacle of your academic career, so to speak? Good question. I don't want to write another one tomorrow, but I I think I will write another book. I'd like to. Um, I'm currently doing a research project on energy and Scottish nationalism, and actually over the last sort of fourteen or fifteen months, I've I've recorded interviews with over thirty people. Um, I've visited a lot of archives that relate to the SNP, the Green Party, the wider ecological movement and the anti-nuclear movement. Dr Linda Ross has also been working on the project as a research assistant and has done loads of great work. She's from a nuclear history background. So over the next year or two, I expect to be writing up uh, journal articles and papers on those themes. I'm also starting a larger project uh, in January, a funded scholarship with the British Academy and the Wilson Foundation that that's based on some of those same themes, but over a larger area, I guess. Um, it's based across the UK, and it's looking at the long movement out of coal. So I'm looking at the building of new energy infrastructures around oil and gas, nuclear and, and renewables, and I'm going to be taking a workplace and community focus to that, but also considering territorial politics. So building to some extent on the, the nationalism side of that, I'm going to think about different regions of England, 
nationalism in Wales and, and energy in Northern Ireland as well. So I'd, I'd like to, you know, it's once I've finished that project, and that's going to take me three years, to probably write another book that thinks about energy transitions and how politics in everyday life in different parts of the UK have been reshaped by big changes and big decisions around um, the UK's energy mix. What I want to ask you about now is your work as a lecturer at the University of Glasgow. Tell me how that came to be and what about that means the most to you? Well, I I worked, uh, after I got my PhD, I worked at the University of the West of Scotland for several years and I enjoyed my time teaching and research in social sciences there. Um, I was lucky enough to be appointed to a, a lectureship in global inequalities at the University of Glasgow uh, beginning early in 2020. So I started my job and then the pandemic arrived, essentially. Um, I think firstly, what I really value about my job is that I get to teach and research economic and social history in its own terms. There's not many places in the UK. I think there's only one other a university in the UK which has a dedicated economic and social history department or subject area and that means a lot to me. I think that this is an important way to approach and understand history and it means the themes I'm interested in around labour and work, working class history, oral history, uh, memory, energy and the environment, they're all seen as integral and valuable themes to be researched in a historical plane and I'm very privileged to have um, a really good group of colleagues with interest in very diverse areas um, who are also very supportive and who I've been able to work closely with in, in different ways over the last couple of years. It meant when COP came for instance that I was able to work with one of my colleagues Helen Yaffe who's a senior lecturer and an expert on Cuba's recent history to co-host an event including expert panellists from Cuba about Scotland and Cuba's experience of renewable energy and being at the university, being well supported there to pursue my own research interests um, and also work with others, I think is, is really what's meant most to me, alongside being able to work with very committed students, um, both students from, from in and around Scotland and also from around the world as well in different courses and I've really enjoyed this academic year being able to alongside my colleague Dr Sean Benata teach a new oral history course for instance and some of the students on that course are actually recording their own oral histories through that and I think that's been a really positive experience for me. Obviously we've spoken about deindustrialization, and that was mainly to do with coal Looking at present day, the, the fossil fuel that we're about to or close to running out of is oil. What do you make of the UK government policy on the transition away from fossil fuel of oil and towards more renewable energy? I mean, the one thing I will say is that it is true that the UK has decarbonised it and it, by world standards, a pretty impressive rate. Um, I think there are qualifiers to that, and one of which is that the extent of deindustrialization in Britain has actually made that transition easier. Um, and, you know, we're quite happy to import things from other countries that are made in highly questionable ways, environmentally as well as in terms of labour standards. So we do need to be aware of that. I think there's a huge contradiction within the UK government. I mean, until very recently within the Scottish government, and I'm given that Nicola Sturgeon appeared to be moving away from our own new stance yesterday, I'm not entirely sure where, where they stand on this here <laughs> anymore either. But um, so, you know, viewers might want to check whenever they're listening to this quite what this, the new line is on Campbell. But clearly it is contradictory to be talking about net zero. I think there's lots of problems with net zero but park that for a minute, you know, it's contradictory to be discussing aiming for net zero in the next 10 years or 15 years and thinking about giving the green light to 
projects like Campbell or other oil exploration projects, which are based on long-term returns. But you don't invest in a new oil field for the short term. Um, and the level of pollution that will be created through extracting and selling that oil is massive. Um, and I think, to be honest with you as well, like the UK is the world's oldest carbon producer. I mean, I was sort of joking that it's quite fitting in a lot of ways that Glasgow held COP, given that James Watt uh, pioneered the modified steam engine, which was absolutely instrumental in the beginnings of the global carbon economy. Um, you know, nobody's quite had the, the guts to say we made climate change happen. We had an impact. But there is a, you know, there is a truth to that. And I'm not saying that this should be some sort of like self lifting session or anything like that. But I do think that it does mean the UK is a rich country, it's a wealthy country. I, I've read somewhere that, and I'm, you know, I think this is the case that. The UK is actually the world's first big, the third biggest carbon emitter of all time, just because it had so long of being the world's chief producer and burner of coal. So in that context, I don't think you can call on China or India or, or smaller uh, developing economies to make large sacrifices whilst being willing to extract new fuels. Um, I you know, willing to drill for oil, willing to, in particular. Um, I do accept, and I think there are legitimate fears and concerns in the northeast of Scotland and the Highlands and, and other places that depend heavily on, on the sector. And obviously that recent past that we've just talked about, uh, deindustrialization in the coal fields, that frames people's understanding in Britain of what happens when equals an industry down, and very understandably so. I was going to ask you that. What happens to Aberdeen, the city of Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, if and when the oil exploration stops? I mean, I think something we need to start from here is a realisation that the oil workforce is shrinking anyway, and it's shrinking because of yeah, economic forces. That, in a way, there's a bit of a false debate taking place here because it seems to be the, the idea is, oh, we could just have what we've got now or we can close it down for environmental reasons like that. That isn't what's happened. Um, you might remember, I, I certainly remember, uh, in the debate over independence in around 2014. The, the value the yeah. value of a barrel yeah. of oil. It was all about the value that. of the barrel of oil collapsed um, just after, and that became a talking point. And, you know, understandably, nationalists and unionists were debating that for different points of view. But actually... We can also think about what that meant for Aberdeen and what that meant for the world economy. Um, the barrel, the, the value of a barrel of oil has never recovered to 2014 levels. And I think it's unlikely. I mean, I'm, I might be wrong. Maybe I'll be, maybe I'll be proven wrong on that, but I think it's unlikely. Um, I think, interestingly, until recently, people had this, the mindset of around oil was this fear that we were going to run out of oil. We're not going to run out of oil. Like oil is going to run out of us. Um, the way things are, like there's there's huge supplies of oil around the world, um, and the the birth of fracking has made that even more true. That we're not going to run out of oil, and North Sea oil is expensive oil. It's difficult to get out of the ground. Um, it was seen as politically safe oil in the 1970s and 1980s when the oil price was also very, very high. Um, I don't... So, it's, um, you know, and also the easy, the easiest oil has been extracted out of the North Sea. I'm not saying that isn't mean there's lot, lots more oil that could, in theory, be extracted. Um, but it's what oil analysts call a mature basin. So... One interesting way of thinking about this is actually who owns the North Sea. So in the 1970s, 1980s, the big oil majors owned the North Sea. Oil companies you've heard of, like BP or Chevron or Esso, they owned the North Sea or Shell. 
a Commonwealth, the think tank, produced a really useful map recently, which shows you who owns the North Sea now. And it's owned by a mixture of uh, private equity companies, essentially, you know, hedge funds. Um, and um, state-owned enterprises from other countries. I mean, loads of stuff in Britain is owned by governments from other countries, which is another discussion. But it's not owned by these big oil majors, though. They've got out. And that's a sign, again, the North Sea's maturing, um, that the workforce is going to get smaller. Like, even if you give Campbell the go-ahead, that's not going to cancel out the fact that our big, old wells are going to start to dry up and only so much oil will be extracted and the workforce the workforce is shrinking uh, you know tens of thousands of oil related jobs have been lost over the last few years so I, I just think it's really quite important we have that in mind um, what could happen or what will happen that was what you asked so well I think the oil workforce is going to shrink anyway I think that's going to happen Um the rate at which it strikes, obviously, is up for the day. Um, and also decommissioning could be a big opportunity. We should, you know, the dismantling of the North Sea um, is actually an economic opportunity. If it's done in Scotland, and there's every chance it isn't. I mean, according to Jake Malloy from the uh, RMT trade union, who's a former oil worker in the the leading rep trade union representative for oil workers, these oil rigs have been taken out of the side of the world. That was telling me about it in an interview I did with them earlier this year. And that's true. Um, and it's true of the wind farms in the other direction as well. Um, I think that there was an assumption in Scotland until quite recently that renewables were going to unproblematically replace oil as a source of employment. Um, I think the problem with that is that actually renewable generation isn't particularly labour intensive. I mean, oil extraction isn't that labour intensive. It's not like coal mining, which is exceedingly labour intensive, but it's quite labour intensive. You still need a few hundred guys on an oil rig to get, or you know, maybe less than that, but you still need tens of people on an oil rig to get stuff out of the ground. You don't need very many people at all to maintain a wind farm once it's up. So then you're relying on manufacturing. And if we're going to build these wind turbines through the global supply chains that currently dominate wind production, then um, that's, not, that's not delivering at the moment. Like wind manufacturing is not a place to go and make a career and get a stable job. And, you know, it's not a place that's, it's not a sector that's expanding and delivering for communities in Scotland just now. That, that's just the fact of the matter. Um, I hope that changes, but there aren't that many indications that it will. It would take quite big changes in government policy to achieve that. What was your immediate intuition when you had heard the SNP and Greens had formed a coalition? Did you think that was a good thing for the direction of renewable energy? and decarbonisation in Scotland? Well, for me, the big question was whether we were going to get a state-owned energy company, and we aren't. Um, I think that's quite concerning, actually. I guess having green pressure inside the government could be useful. Um, at the same time, it also does mean that one of the main critics of the government are no longer there. Um, yes, that's, it was, yeah. you know, I think that it's also a real shame in my view that Monica Lennon has stood down as the, the Labour spokesperson on energy. I think she's done a really, really good job. I think that she brought Campbell onto the agenda. Um, I think that she frankly bounced the Labour Party into a better position on Campbell than they were likely to have otherwise, but she also brought a lot of pressure to bear on the SNP on that. and. I wonder if we'll see a retreat from the stance that Sturgeon took recently. It looked like to me, I know that at the end of the day, these are all rhetorical positions anyway, and the UK government has the substantive power, but it is interesting that clearly there are different pressures on the SNP over oil. There's that sort of northeast 
industry lobby group that we've been talking about. And there's also the sense that younger people in Scotland, particularly centre left to left wing young people, feel otherwise. And I think that was an interesting moment when Nicola Sturgeon was confronted by those activists at the, the Govan Hill Festival this summer. She looked very uncomfortable on the question. Um, that's quite important. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not especially optimistic about Scottish politics. Is the 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 grim answer? I mean, I suppose part of the problem is as well that we're in an area where, in a lot of ways, it's quite e quite easy to say all the right things and less easy to do them. And there's also a lot of pressure to say things are going well, especially if you're in government. And I think I'm I'm particularly concerned about the employment effects around that. And I think the we really do need to accept that major progress has been made, particularly on electricity generation. And, you know, that is a real achievement for decarbonisation. That that bit genuinely is world leading. But yesterday I saw SNP MSPs or MPs saying that they were achieving a world leading just transition. I don't think that's true. <laughs> the, the stagnation yeah. of employment and low carbon energy. I mean, one thing I will say, it's not necessary for a just transition for all energy workers to stay in the energy sector. Like it's okay if we move to a more carbon intensive energy sector, but we need to find other jobs for people and for regions that are that have depended on energy production in that case. Because at the moment we do seem to be stuck in this mindset where it's like, Oh, so we trade in these oil jobs and they have to be wind jobs. I mean, that that isn't the case. Like they could be doing something else, but we need to do something though. Um, and I think importantly, we need to do something that uses those industrial skills. Because if we don't, then then we probably will be looking at transitions to lower value added, less well paid, less secure alternatives. <laughs> As we discussed earlier, the one of the big variables for people voting in the 2014 referendum was the issue of the oil price and that how that would impact the economy. Let's just say there was a referendum in 2024, number two. How different would the debating point over energy be? What would the deciding factor be in your opinion and people's minds? I think it is really interesting that it's been really quite recently that oil has dropped off uh, the nationalist case. And I mean nationalists of a small end there, like the pro-independence argument. Um, you know, I've been reading stuff recently from 2014 and, and my research and doing interviews with people that, that remember it. And it's I think 2014 was quite a big moment in actually maybe denting oil nationalism. Like, the SNP's It's Scotland's Oil campaign was really successful in the early 1970s. And I would argue then from 1971, when that slogan was pioneered, until 2014, the case for independence, the dominant public argument case for independence, was about oil. And that actually anchored the SNP in the centre-left position in the sense that it was about saying, we could be a wealthy society we could have a vibrant welfare state. We could be a more egalitarian society if we get... A sovereign oil fund. Exactly, ex exactly. If we get control of that oil, which is going to be misspent and misused by UK government. That, <laughs> that was the position for a very, very long time. That was absolutely integral to the, the economic argument. And to some extent, it allowed the SNP to sidestep more difficult questions about redistributing wealth and power, actually, because you can redistribute this kind of magic gold that's, that's out of the sea and that you know we should all have access to. Um, so I think, I think because of the oil price drop-off after the referendum and also the impression that Actually, 45% was as high as you were going to get with the oil argument. And that, you know, 45% was a major achievement in some ways in 2014, given the starting point. But it was still a massive defeat in other ways as well. So, you know, I think there was a realisation that actually oil was becoming a weapon that was almost being used against the independence argument. And, you know, if you look at 
material or red material that I've like ever produced recent, you know, recently read it. And that says don't don't mortgage your future. This is risky. Oil is risky. That was part of the argument that was being put forward. That seems, you know, I, I think that there's a real sense that, that that has to be the case. What I'm interested in now, though, is are we now in a position where unionists, or, or certainly the Conservative Party, it's not always very helpful to talk about unionists and nationalists, the Conservative Party seem to be the most pro-oil party in Scotland. Um, they're the party which is which are talking about oil, and they're talking about oil in terms of jobs, really. They're not, you know, the sense that oil is some fiscal boon which is going to produce billions of pounds for the state. That seems to be old hat now. Um, fiscal, the fiscal impact is a lot less than it used to be. So it's about jobs in the northeast of Scotland instead, and I think that will continue to be an issue. I think the Tories think that's a way in. In the northeast, and they might well be right. I mean, polling I saw said that thirty six percent of people in the northeast of Scotland think that they should drill for oil. That's not actually that high, but it's also quite a lot in a first past the post system. Um, so I, I think the big change will be. I mean, this was already this has been going on since to, at least two thousand seven, but if not before. But the the case will be bedrock on renewables, not oil basically. Um, in many ways, in SNP language, renewables has kind of just replaced oil as the source of wealth and prosperity. Um, I saw Kate Forbes, the finance secretary, obviously, did a, an interview just before the SNP conference where she said that we should use Scotland's natural resources to feed hungry children, and she specifically referred to renewables, which is fairly reminiscent of the welfareist oil argument. I mean, in a lot of ways, I think it's less convincing. Uh, you can't export barrels of renewables in the same way that you can export barrels of oil. And it's not... You, you can sell electricity, but it's not nearly as profitable as oil certainly has been at some points in time. But nevertheless, I think that that argument will be the one that's put forward. And I think that's an interesting legacy of oil, almost what you're saying there, the way that it will go a complete 180 having been from, it basically was the oil price, the oil price, the oil price is risky, risky, risky from the no side versus Scotland needs a sovereign oil fund from the yes side and do you do you believe that the argument of renewable energy is what will carry the day if and when, I think there will be an NDRF2, so let's say when NDRF2 takes place, is the renewable energy argument the new currency and oil type thing? I'm not sure. I mean, I suppose the difference is that everybody's supposed to be committed to renewables. The Tories are supposed to be committed to renewables. Boris Johnson's supposed to be committed to a green industrial revolution. So the Tory argument is that it's better to be part of a big state that, you know, will look after and develop renewables. Which, frankly, would be a much more convincing argument if the UK was a developmentalist state. Um, you know, I was, I know, I, I noticed yesterday that Equinor is leading the development of uh, Humberside, where they're going to develop this huge hydrogen facility and other important developments. Equinor used to be known as Statoil. It was um, Norway's uh, energy company, which Britain had an equivalent called. British National Oil Corporation, but BNOC was privatised um, and sold off in the 1980s. So effectively, we had one of these, but now we're asking the Norwegians to come and do it for us. Um, sorry, that's a bit of a distraction from the question. But I think basically both sides are going to have to lay claim to renewables. I think the, the SNP slash yes slash green case is going to have to be, we'll do it better, we're in the lead. And the no side will have to be, we've got these broad shoulders, we are committed to developing a green economy. Britain is actually in the lead on decarbonisation in many ways. I think, to be honest, the big weakness in both those arguments is the, uh, the lack of state initiative in both cases and the lack then of industrial benefit that we've just discussed, that, you know, 
Britain is a leading place in the world for other governments or large multinational enterprises to make money out of building wind turbines. Isn't that partic- or Scotland could be even better at it? Isn't a particularly uh, interesting argument? I don't think. In terms of your own opinion, who made the better argument in twenty fourteen on the the issue of oil? I guess it depends what you mean, because in some ways, um, the nationalist criticism of the UK government's management of North Sea oil, I think, is very very hard to argue against. Uh, the more I've read about it, the more I've done research on that, the more convinced that I came into it, I will admit, predisposed to a sense that oil was wasted. Um, but I think that's hard to argue with. Um, the UK government from the 1970s, both Labour and Conservative governments, prioritised extracting oil out of the ground as quickly as possible, gave big business, quite generous conditions for doing so. I think Tony Venn as Secretary of State for Energy between 1975 and 1979 fought a very valiant rearguard battle to try and rein in some of those inclinations um, and had some success in starting to build a public sector stake in the North Sea, almost convinced or I don't know. We can debate how, but certainly put forward a case in the cabinet for a, a sovereign wealth fund based on oil as well. But um, you know that that was unsuccessful, and we all we all know that Margaret Thatcher's government benefited from massive uh, inflows of oil revenues and used them to redistribute wealth and power negatively and finance dole queues and deindustrialization. Uh, that that is all very true. And I think that is a a credible nationalist argument. The less credible nationalist argument relates to what would have happened afterwards. The predictions for, you know, there was an extent to which Scotland's future was then determined based on the oil price. I think it, and and I know that that's been denied since, but I think that is built into the white paper. It's, It's hard to avoid that. For me, the biggest problem isn't even that, though. I think that is a problem. Um, the bigger problem is also that these old arguments the nationalists put forward were actually based around a politics of control and ownership, uh, a very critical view of multinational enterprises in particular. That changed over the late 80s, over the 90s and 2000s, and then nationalists start to put forward the argument that, well, we'd nurture the industry better because it matters more to us. And that starts to mean things like we'd give out better tax cuts. Um, you know, we'd look after this industry better in partnership with the multinationals. There wasn't a proposal in 2014 to nationalise the oil companies. I know Jim Sellers went on the telly and threatened a day of reckoning that Alex Salmon um, swiftly clamped down on, either on referendum day or the day before it. Um, but, you know, that... That wasn't a serious proposal. Um, Jim Sellers did that as a very isolated individual and probably because he was frustrated, actually, with how little was being said on those lines. So I am kind of left wondering what's the point in exercising sovereignty if we're not going to do those sorts of things, to be honest. Anything with it? Yeah. My final question, another two-parter. What do you think the legacy of COP26 is for A, the world in terms of decarbonisation and then B for Scotland and the UK? Good question. Um, <laughs> I'm not an IR. I'm not an international relations scholar. Um, and frankly, I spent more time at COP26 standing on picket lines with striking um, cleansing workers and hosting an event for the Worker Stories Collective, which I'm part of, a collective which is recorded in... Um, stories from workplaces across Scotland during the pandemic. We had a, a big exhibition at something called the Govan Free State that was held in Galgale. It was great fun. We had about 100 people there and people read out their stories and sang songs and read poems. And Some of them were very moving and quite upsetting as well. But 
Man's the reason I'm, I'm telling you about these activities and thinking about the strike is I think in many ways for me they'll be the real agents of environmental change and social change that we need to see. I, I thought the protest was really important. I thought it was, you know, I was surprised how big it was given the context of COVID and all the rest of it. And and I thought it was a good mix of local people and, and visitors, important visitors from around the world. Um, and I thought the language was quite good. System change, not climate change. And I, I'm old enough to have been on the Make Poverty History March in 2005 in Edinburgh. And that, the language of that was terrible. That was very paternalistic, very much about the rich world helping the poor world um, and, and, and without, you know, taking responsibility for the condition that the poor world was in, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. So I thought this was much better, actually. Um, and in terms of the summit itself, I mean, I'm really troubled by the result of the summit. Um, for me, it confirms that we're increasingly moving into a world where climate change is being anticipated and is going to be managed by elites rather than prevented. I know that there's an extent to which obviously some climate change is going to happen anyway, so we're going to have to adapt. Like that is that is partially true. Um, and the current, you know, reactionary discourse around migrants in Britain doesn't show that we're in any fit state to start accepting climate refugees in the number that we ought to be. But Nevertheless, as much as adaptation has to be part of it, it seems to me that if we can't even set over-ambitious targets that are at the level we need to meet as a bare minimum, then, then I can't see how we're not going to be in a scenario where we're going to have to adapt further and further. And I think that could have some really, really concerning worrying consequences politically. <laughs> well, that's a cheery note to end on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it's, it's it's poignant because it's true and it, it is the it's basically where we are just now. COP has just happened, so it's that's that's the pertinent question. And that's a wrap. A massive thank you to this week's guest for coming on to the show. I hope you all enjoyed listening as much as I enjoyed chatting. All of the relevant social media accounts can be found in the show notes. The usual bits and pieces for me to see you out. The best way to keep up to date with the latest goings on relating to Lost for Words is to follow using the handle at Lost for Words Pod on both Twitter and Instagram. Send a message on either Twitter or Instagram if you have anything you'd like to ask a guest or for a guest suggestion or even just to leave any feedback. The best way to support the show is to hit the subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts and if you use an Apple device, a 5 star review in the podcast app would be amazing. If you like what you hear, tell someone, word of mouth also helps us to grow. Finally, to round off, all of your support and continued listening is genuinely appreciated. It means a lot to me to have you on this journey too. I am your host Jason and I hope to have you back next week for another episode of the Lost for Words podcast.